and um, I'll be happy to <clears throat> discuss today about a type of research that we have been doing in the lab, trying to figure out what's the molecular basis of cancer metastasis and, and more importantly, how to therapeutically target some vulnerabilities in metastatic cancer in order to achieve um, a better outcome for patients with stage four disease. So as, as you probably all know, most cancer patients do not die from their primary tumors. Most of them die from metastasis to distant vital organs. And that's why when you classify patients into early stage cancer versus late stage cancer, the five-year survival is dramatically different. You can see that here um, for for patients with localized stage, uh, you know, one disease or regional disease only in lymph node spread, uh, breast colorectal cancer melanoma has pretty good survival, five year survival, but if they have metastatic disease, survival is much lower, 20% or lower. And that has, has not really improved much uh, over the last 20 years. Um, when you think about therapeutics in cancer, it's important to identify the so-called driver genes that drive tumor initiation, progression, and metastasis. So one way to do that is, you know, through in the history of cancer research, through basic research, we discover genes that are mutated in cancer and drive cancer progression. And with the completion of human genome uh, and the beginning of the cancer genome sequencing, there are additional frequently mutated genes identified, for example, IDH1. So uh, those genes are important because they drive the, the transformation of a normal cell to become cancer cell. But we also know that not all cancer cells are created equal. Some of them are not metastatic. If they are surgically removed, usually it does not cause problem. But out of millions of cells that are you know, disseminated uh, from patients' primary tumor every day into blood circulation, only a, a small fraction of the, those tumors are capable of forming metastasis. So it's suspected that there are so-called metastasis genes that endow additional properties to those tumor cells that allow them to metastasize and eventually kill the patients. So one approach to, to think about this is to maybe if you can sequence the metastasis, the genome with the metastatic tumor, and then compare with the genome of the primary tumor, can we identify additional consistently occurring mutations that only occur in metastatic cancer? And if so, they could be driver genes of metastasis. But in fact, when those work are done, there are very few, if any, recurring mutations that could be associated with metastasis. And that even led to some argument that there's no so-called so metastasis gene. Um, you know, they, they do not exist which conflict with our finding, you know, of the observation in the field that, you know, not all tumors are metastatic and they must have additional properties that make them capable of metastasize, metastasis. So um, over the last couple of decades, uh, a lot of research is done in the field that lead to the following um, hypothesis uh, that I summarize here. So the tumor cell needs to acquire additional so-called metastatic uh, competency. An argument is that those uh, metastatic components is acquired when the tumor cell develop ability to deal with additional stress that they encounter during the progression of cancer. For example, when the tumor disseminates, survive in the bloodstream, and then try to evade the immune attack and form a uh, newly formed colony in distant organ, and then all go to become kind of a significant metastasis. They have to evade the immune surveillance, the immune suppression, you know, the, the immune surveillance stress. You have to uh, deal with oxidative stress, genomic instability stress, um, folded protein stress. And they also have to adapt to different kinds of metabolism that you hear uh, a lot from, from today's uh, lectures. So it's those genes that allow those tumor, tumor cells to deal with the stress better that gives them the competency to survive better and as a consequence, also acquire the ability to, to metastasize because they overcome those hurdles or, or stress that they encounter in increasing level during the progression to metastatic disease. So you might, you must, uh, you know, uh, question what's the difference between the classical driver oncogene that we know about, for example, EGFR, HER2, BRAF, that are consistently mutated in cancer versus the, the, the so-called cancer finish gene that I try to define here. 
So the key differences are the following. Uh, the, on the driver oncogenes, you can see them frequently mutated in recur as re uh, recurrent mutations associated with a particular type of cancer. So for example, ECFR mutation in lung cancer, in, in some colon cancer and so on, and BRAF in melanoma. In, in cancer fitness gene, you, all, you actually rarely see them mutated in metastatic cancer, but they often have elevated expression by epigenetic alterations, or they just simply have a, a increased functions in aggressive cancers. The normal counterpart of the oncogene also often have essential functions for normal physiology of normal tissues. And that's why when you try to target them, in develop, by developing molecular targeted therapeutics, often you see immediately uh, a significant response, but often uh, you have treatment failure uh, through multiple mechanisms that I described here, and also because of the toxicity you know, to normal tissues that limit the therapeutic window. On the other hand, the cancer fitness gene is less essential compared to uh, in normal tissues because normal cell under physiological condition do not experience high level of stress. And they, they have, therefore they are less dependent on the function of cancer fitness genes. So when you try to target cancer fitness gene, it's less likely you see toxicity or side effect in normal tissues. And also one of the key distinctive feature between oncogene and cancer fitness gene is if you overexpress oncogene or make a transgenic mice that overexpress oncogene in a certain tissue, you, that could lead to transformation of a normal cell to become a cancer cell or development of tissue in mouse models. The cancer fitness gene by themselves do not have transforming ability. They simply just make the tumor cells survive better under stress. Uh, and so they do not fit the criteria of oncogene. They are not called oncogene because they don't have transforming ability. So I already showed you some of the examples of oncogene. The classical cancer fitness gene is one great example here, PDL1 which is often expressed in, in high level in tumors, they are not transforming by itself. But also it's important for cancer progression and metastasis because it suppresses the immune response. Another example I'm gonna show you today is a, a gene that we study in the lab for the last 15 years called metadherin. You probably never heard of it because it's relatively obscure, but it plays uh, a, a, a key function in a broad spectrum of, of cancers that also fits the criteria of the cancer fitness gene. So the reason why we came to, um, you know, the, we, that led us to the identify the implication of methyrin is uh, based on a question that has existed in the field for a long time. A clinical observation that a lot of the, the patients have early stage breast cancer often could have very different clinical outcome. Um, for example, some of the patients will be treated with surgery and then follow up with adjuvant chemo, and they do not have, have recurrence of disease. They are essentially cancer-free, they are cured. On the other hand, there are patients who have the same early stage breast cancer and they look similar under the microscope, but they, they could develop a recurrence quickly after initial treatment that often occur in the distant side and metastatic disease that are resistant to treatments and eventually kill the patients. So there has been a lot of interest to develop biomarkers, unbiased, unbiased biomarker, molecular biomarkers that will help clinicians identify high-risk cancer and so that it could be treated accordingly. So this work I show you here done by Van Vier and colleague in 20 years ago, uh, identify a, a 70 gene signature, so-called poor prognosis profile. If the tumor have 50 gene up, and 20 gene down, yes, they fit the criteria of so-called poor bonus cancer and they have poor outcome. If they have the opposite signature, they usually have good outcome, good prognosis cancer. And this, bio, this panel biomarker has been applied apply in the clinical practice, so-called memory print di molecular diagnostic. That's helpful to identify high-risk uh, uh, disease, but there's not uh, tell us why those high-risk poor prognosis cancer are so aggressive. What's the driver gene behind them? And so my lab at the time hopes to identify the driver gene uh, behind poor prognosis cancer. And the idea is based on the history of driver gene discovery. Uh, it turns out that many of the driver oncogene are located in genomic locus that are frequently mutated uh, in a particular kind 
of cancer, for example, by translocation or uh, amplification in other genomic events. So what we want to see is if we can find recurrent genomic alterations, such as genomic amplification associated with poor prognosis cancer. If we can find a genomic landmark, we can then hope to identify driver gene that are located in that locus. So the, the way we did that is using a computational approach. Uh, it's done by former postdoc Guo Hong Hu, who, who did his uh, PhD study at, at Rutgers and then complete my uh, postdoc journey in my lab. So what he did is he developed an algorithm, computational algorithm to turn differentially among a gene expression difference between poor prognosis cancer versus good prognosis cancer into prediction of genomic copy number, re genomic region copy number gain or loss. By based on the assumption or, or the hypothesis that if a genomic locus is amplified in a poor prognosis cancer, um, the gene in that locus and its neighbors are likely to be having elevated expression, um, you know, together. So by calculating a so-called running sum neighborhood score, by uh, calculating a running sum with differential gene expression of the gene in locus plus its neighbors with the neighbors that are far away would be given a decaying smaller weight. And that running sum turns out to be a so-called neighborhood score of a prediction of copy number gain or copy number loss. So using this algorithm, uh, he analyzed three large clinical data sets and he identified one locus in chromosome AQ22 that, um, a lot uh, that, that is predicted to be amplified in poop bonuses tumors. And this is, this is pure mathematical prediction. So what we did next is analyze clinical samples at CNJ, and we identify about a quarter of breast cancer indeed have AQ22 high copy number amplification. And those tumor also have poor outcome in terms of metastasis-free survival. So this initial uh, finding identify a genomic locus that could potentially harbor a driver gene of poor prognosis cancer. And uh, what we did next is to look at this locus is a small locus. So there are only about a handful, about half dozen genes that are highly differentially expressed between poor prognosis tumor versus good prognosis tumor. And what we can do next is uh, overexpress each gene one by one in a human breast cancer cell line. And they inject that cell line into the tail vein of the mice to develop spontaneous, uh, to develop experimental lung metastasis. And uh, using this experiment to see if you overexpress any of this gene, can they increase lung metastasis ability? And the result is, as you can see in here, only when we overexpress MTDH met adhering, which is at the middle of this amplicon, it can significantly lead to increased lung metastasis of tumor in the mice. And another set of study we show that this gene not only increased lung metastasis, it also caused a broad spectrum chemo resistance uh, in, in breast cancer. So this two mechanism, increased metastasis and chemo resistance, perhaps is behind the reason why this could be a driver gene of metastatic cancer. By the time when we published that work, uh, there's basically no literature or study done on this gene at all. Um, and there's no understanding about its role in normal physiology development and also in cancer. So what we did next is uh, done by a graduate student, leading one. Um, she create a gene trap allele of metahering and then basically create whole body knockout mice from embryonic stage. And as you can see in here, even though the metahering is knockout in this mice, the embryo developed normally and the mice is born in normal maintaining ratio and then the, the, the mice will, will grow up completely normally. So no phenotype, as we can see in experimental animals, when we knock out methylene. So we use the wild type and methylene knockout mice to cross with different mouse model of breast cancer and other cancer. And we found that consistently, if you lose one or two copies, especially two copies of methylene, there's a significant decrease in tumor initiation and tumor burden. So for example, in the MNTV, PONT model um, of breast cancer, you can see knocking out you know, one all in green and two in blue, a leo of metering, slow down tumor initiation by about 20 days. And then when you count the two total tumor volume, uh, there's a dose depending effect of reduced tumor growth uh, when you knock out one or two a leo of metering. 
And this is clearly showing here, the mice is in the same age in wild type versus mature knockout mice. And they both express PRNT oncogene in the mammary gland. But the wild type mice have massive primary tumors that metastasize lungs and kill the mice. The knockout mice, even though they have the oncogene in the mammary gland, they develop very little tumor and they almost never metastasize the lungs. Same result was found by, uh, in her, her, her two OB2 model, in C3 models, the wind models, you know, across multiple breast cancer models we, we, we observed. And so um, this is showing the important role of material not only for metastasis, but also for tumor initiation. But the caveat is that, as I show you, this whole body knockout, knockout material from very early embryonic stage, not exactly copying, you know, gene changes in, in patients when, you know, they already become adults. The key question is, if you knock out material in tumors uh, that are already fully developed in a patient, does it still, is it still important? Does it, you know, is it a suitable therapeutic target? To answer that question, we create a conditional knockout material, which flocks the material allele, and then cross into uh, the ubiquitous express Cree ER, in which the ER, uh, the, the Cree gene will be induced by treating the mice with thermosphere. So we cross this mice with PYNT model again, and we wait for the tumor to form before we start treating the mice with either the vehicle or thermosophilin. And we show that at that stage, even uh, you know, when the tumor is already formed, at that stage, if you start eliminating the material by thermosophilin treatment, you still can get a significant decrease in tumor growth, reduce tumor burden at the end point, um, and also uh, at the end point, and then also more significantly is almost uh, complete elimination of lung metastasis as you can see in here. So uh, this suggests that, um, you know, this material is important for breast cancer. And we are also curious since we have a material knockout, whether material is also important for other cancer as well. So we cross the material knockout and wild time mice with you know, mouse models of lung cancer, carotid cancer, liver cancer, many other types of kind of cancer, uh, prostate cancer, for example. The result is consistent. When you knock out metadhering, a significant decrease in tumor growth, and I'm showing you here is the APC mean mice of intestinal cancer, reduce tumor uh, uh, burden, and then increase survival in the mice. Same result was found in uh, lung cancer and prostate cancer. So. The take home message here is that even though we initially discovered material as a gene associated with metastasis and chemo resistance in poor prognosis cancer, it actually play a rather early role in supporting the initiation of uh, the primary tumor. Important to know is that if you make a transgenic mice or overexpressed material either in the mouse or in the tumor cell, it does not cause the transformation of normal cell. So it's not a oncogene by itself but it's essential to sustain the survival of the cell and support the tumor initiation, and progression, metastasis, and chemo resistance. And that fits uh, material uh, with the, the criteria we set for the so-called cancer fitness gene. And also because material whole body knockout mice survive and develop normally, we thought that material is not essential for normal tissue under physiological conditions. And therefore, it's potentially a, a great therapeutic target because it's not important for normal tissue uh, under most conditions, but essential for across most major cancer types. So um, the question then is, how do you target material? We, we have very little biochemical understanding about its function. The next step is to identify its functional partner. And this is done by Andre Blanco, a former grad student, in which he did a co-IP experiment to pull down metahering in the cells and then identify whatever protein that is co-immunoprecipitated with metahering. So by mass spec, he identified this additional band as SND1. Again, you have probably never heard about SND1. It's part of the risk complex for microalgae processing. It's also known to be regulating alternative splicing, uh, maybe as some uh, condition also regulate transcriptional activity as well. It also behaves very similarly as the material. It's highly expressed in poor prognosis cancer. And also, if you knock down, knock out uh, SND1, it also sensitizes the cell to chemotherapy and reduce metastasis. 
So it behaves very similarly to net hearing. And indeed, they function together as a complex. And, and this is done by the Yin Wan in a serious study that I summarize here. The key finding is that this complex is not essential for normal cells, such as memory ground stem cell under physiological conditions, so that if you knock it out, the mice develop completely normally. But under you know, oncogenic stress, um, this complex is critical for the survival of the so-called cancer stem cell or tumor initiating cell. Without uh, meta adhering, if you eliminate it by uh, gene knockout, the SND1 becomes unstable and get degraded quickly when the cell is under stress. And then that leads to apoptosis of TICs, cancer stem cells, and then you have reduced primary tumor growth, reduced metastasis, and sensitization to chemotherapy. So that gives us a possibility to see if we can actually disrupt the complex to have a separated benefit. And to do that, we first solve the co crystal structure of material binding to SND1. In collaboration with Yonasing at uh, University of Wisconsin, she actually did the graduate study at Rutgers and postdoc at, at Princeton. So what we found is that the Mathurian peptide that binds to SND1, showing ye yellow here, required two critical residues in tryptophan, uh, tryptophan residues in red, tryptophan 401, tryptophan 340, that binds to two hydrophobic pocket in the surface of SND1. This binding is critical because if you mutate either one of the tryptophan, you not only eliminate the binding between the two protein by co-IP experiment, you also eliminate the ability of the wild-type material to induce TIC activity in a material knockout uh, cell. And as you can see, the mutant protein is not able to rescue the, the tumor initiation cell activity in the so-called limited dilution uh, <coughs> tumor initiation study when we inject <coughs> the uh, tumor cell into the membrane ground of the of the mice. So that gives us um, the incentive to maybe identify small molecular compounds that look like those tryptophan side chains that bind to the same pocket of SNC1 and potentially block protein protein interaction. So uh, Ming Hun Shen, a former uh, great, uh, postdoc, developed a uh, split roof surface assay for high throughput screening of material SNC1 protein protein interaction inhibitor. So the mechanism, the, uh, the approach is the following. If you split the reciprocase into the N terminal and the C terminal, two half, it, it destroys the reciprocase activity. But if you fuse this uh, two domain of um, reciprocase into the either SMD1 or MTDH, if these two protein interact, it would bring this N terminal and C terminal reciprocase together in the right conformation and reconstitute the reciprocal activity. If you have a small molecule uh, that disrupts the interaction, you will lose the reciprocal activity again. And then, of course, we have uh, you know the the link reciprocal to to as a counter screen to eliminate false positive hits that simply just inhibit reciprocal activity without inhibiting protein protein interaction. And then secondary screen using using FRAT assay. So using uh, multiple screens. We identify a series of compounds that we call C26 and its n locks, which have very similar chemical structure. And you can see in split reciprocal assay, they are almost as potent as the water peptide to inhibit the luciferous activity uh, at micro more uh, IC50. And also, <clears throat> the, the compound is able to block protein protein interaction by co IP experiment. So then uh, we we want to see if the compound is binding to SND1, those pockets, as we predicted. And so we solved, again, the co-crystal structure of the compound binding to SND1. And you can see that it's indeed binding to one of the pockets that is previously occupied by sort of the 401 of methylene. And in this overlay picture, you can see that the, the side chain of uh, methylene in red, the sort of side chain indeed occupy the same cavity as C26A6. So this shows the on-target effect of the compound binding to the target that we, as we predicted. So the next step is to then test this compound to see if it have any therapeutic benefit. And what we did is uh, we inject the tumor cell into the memory gland. So they develop memory gland tumor, primary tumors that eventually metastasize to the lung. What we did is we wait for a tumor to form and then start to treat the mice either with a vehicle 
or with the compound as a single agent. And we can see, can, we can see slow down tumor growth, reduce tumor burden at the end point, and also importantly, significant reduction of lung metastasis. So the next step is the combinational therapy because this compound is very safe for mice. We don't see any side effects as expected. And also because we previously reported that material is important for chemo resistance of, of breast cancer. So maybe combine this compound with chemotherapy will have synergistic benefits. So we have four group of mice here. Uh, one group is treated with vehicle. The other one was the C26A6 single agent. The other one is the classical pacotaxel, and then the fourth one is the combined treatment. So in primary tumor, this tumor is highly sensitive to chemotherapy. You can see strong reduction of primary tumor. The single agent, as I showed you in the previous slide, does have anti-tumor activity as well. But as you can see, the combined treatment have significantly stronger inhibition than either treatment alone. In, uh, so those tumor also metastasize to the lungs. And you can see here, the single agent is pretty effective in reducing lung metastasis. Practitexel alone is not very effective. This is a highly uh, you know, insensitive one in terms of metastasis, but a combined treatment almost completely eliminate lung metastasis. And the mice also survive much longer uh, in blue line here. Um, so we now have two approaches to inhibit matering in our experimental mice models. We have conditional knockout matering after the tumor is formed. So acute genetic knockout matering. And now also we have a pharmacological approach to Block methylene MTDH uh, SDD1 complex with a uh, small molecular compound. So, what we found is that if you profile gene expression in the tumor, either with genetic or pharmacological inhibition of methylene, the change in, in gene expression is consistent. You know, it almost phenocopy each other. And some of the changes is expected. There's reduced proliferation, reduced cell cycle progression, you know, related genes, and then increased apoptosis related genes. But one second, so that also come out on the top of uh, you know, those changes that are consistently changed in both conditions. The so-called uh, the, the interferon gamma response signature, which indicates stronger immune response to tumor. So you can see strong enrichment of the signature in the tumors that have either genetic knockout material or from chronological inhibition of material with C26A6. And this is also consistent with increased leukocyte infiltration, especially CDA T cell infiltration in tumors. And that indicate that when you block material SND1 function, there is a strong anti-tumor immunity that is dependent on CDA T cells. And in a study that we published earlier this year, we showed that the following mechanism, the NTDS SND1 complex binds to a number of RNAs, in some present, including TAP1, TAP2, and among that encodes a very important component for antigen presentation in the tumor cells. And we show that um, if you use the compound to block this complex, it will restore antigen presentation, increase you know, uh, activation of immune response. The tumor cell will, will then start to infiltrate even though many of them become exhausted because of you know, a mechanism to induce uh, T cell exhaustion, for example, increase PD-1, pd one uh, expressing in, in, in the tumors. So we suspect that if you can use C26A6 to activate T cell response, activation, infiltration, and then use anti-PD-1 to keep them active, you will see a synergistic benefit of immunotherapy and essentially turn immunocode tumor in, into immunoreactive heart tumor. And this is exactly what we did, we did here. We have, again, four group of mice, vehicle, anti-PD-1 immunotherapy. And you can see in here, this tumor is actually not very responsive as expected. Uh, the pure empty tumor are not very immunoreactive. So you don't see much benefit from uh, anti-PD-1 therapy. The single agent compound, again, has some anti-tumor effect. But when you combine the two, you have strong inhibition of primary tumor growth and almost complete elimination of lung metastasis. You can also see increased CDAT cell infiltration and then increased CDAT, uh, increased immune activation by interferon gamma uh, you know, expression. So the final test is we, we want to consider whether this treatment can be applied to patients with late state disease, meaning that they already have metastatic cancer in the lungs can we still reverse the course of disease progression and maybe potentially even cure stage four cancer? 
So we mimic that by injecting the tumor into the tail vein of mice. They develop a few weeks, three weeks later, they develop established lung metastasis. We randomize the mice, treat them with one group with vehicle, the other group with combined treatment, CD, C26A6 and anti-PE1. And then five weeks later, you can see that the control group of mice have exponential growth of lung metastasis and the mice pretty much die at week 10. The mice that receive combined treatment, about half of them have reversion of disease and clearing, almost complete clearing of disease as you can see in here. And then the rest of them have a dramatic uh, in, uh, slowdown of lung metastasis, metastasis progression and the mice survive much longer. So this indicate that potentially this could be further developed as a, as a and that tumor um, immunotherapeutic agent. So in conclusion, I'm using here Materium as an example to uh, show you a class of gene that should be getting more attention in, in terms of therapeutic intervention. Those are not classical oncogenes. They are not frequently mutated in tumors. They are not uh, oncogenic by themselves, but they're essential for the tumor under stress when they try to progress uh, to metastasis when they try to survive in a distant organ, and then they, when they try to survive different kinds of therapy we, we apply to patients. And Mathurian, what it does is intrinsically, it supports the survival of cell under stress by inducing the genes that are important for you know, proliferation and, and anti apoptotic activity. At the same time, it also downregulate immune uh, response, suppress immune response by downregulating antigen presentation. And by targeting this complex, we also, we make the tumor vulnerable because one, intrinsically, they are less able to survive stress. Uh, they will undergo apoptosis. It's, it's intrinsically, they are more vulnerable to immune surveillance, immune uh, attack. This also show you an example of uh, how we conduct multidisciplinary research to go from essentially from the bad to the bench, uh, bad side to the bench and back to the bad side to benefit the patients. We start a project by, you know, try to address an important clinical question, what make poor prognosis cancer aggressive? And we use genomic computation approach to identify locus, found a gene, use transgenic mice, genetic knockout mice to uh, analyze its important role in development and in cancer. And we show uh, its role in supporting TICs in, you know, also other important aspects of, of cancer in immuno uh, immunology. We then use, our chemistry and structural biology approach to identify its functional partner, solve the crystal structure of the complex, and use that insight to do high super drug screen, identify hits, and then finally, we're in a step of from hit to lead, and hopefully close the loop to bring the benefit for the patients that we, we start with. With that, I want to thank the students and postdoc that I already showed you throughout my talk. Uh, they contribute to the work, as well as many of our collaborators that I, I listed here. And this work is supported by Ludo, uh, by Coleman, and many other foundations I, I show you here. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I will be happy to take questions.